Guided Lecture Series. Uh, today, we are really lucky to have um, a very distinguished member of the computer security community um, who has been involved in computer security for more years than some of you have been alive. Um, I'm of that. Uh, Bill Murray. And uh, I don't know how well he tells jokes, but he does tell a good story about how to design uh, security architectures uh, to enforce corporate policies and organizational policies. Before we start, uh, Dan Warren wanted me to make sure that you had this reminder. The information ethics course number uh, that we sent out in the email uh, said one thing. The real course number is CS4920. If you're signing up for the information ethics course, um, and the teacher will be Bill Murray, so you can test him out um, for this afternoon. If you want to um, get a copy of Solvus, stuff like that, tell him he, he, he made up. He made up the, the syllabus. He has a copy. Well, no, I mean the students. If anybody here wants to get oh, a copy. Oh, if the student is interested, he'll give you a little bit. It preview. should. It should be quite novel, but it so, is not technical. Novel, but not technical. So, without me taking up any more time, let's get started with the lecture. Good afternoon. How many of you were heard my last lecture when I was on campus a year ago? Okay, good. Uh, this is a much smaller group, a much more intimate setting. I hope that in this group you will feel free to challenge me. If you succeed in challenging me, we will all learn something. Uh, and please fe also feel free to, to uh, raise questions at any time you want to. If you recall my last lecture, fundamentally what I told you was that uh, I am not a believer in vulnerability analysis. I am not a believer in, in patching and fixing. Uh, instead, uh, I am a believer in defense and depth. But when I get to the end of that presentation, I leave a whole lot of, of defenses up on the screen a whole lot of recommendations up on the screen that I never really get into and support. Fundamentally, what I'm going to suggest to you today is that patching and fixing operating systems and applications as a means of resisting attack just doesn't cut it. And it doesn't cut it for a whole bunch of reasons. And therefore, I'm going to suggest to you some other alternative ways for resisting attack. Now, the ways that I am going to suggest to you are uh, strategies. The strategies are based upon tactics which lots of network administrators and system administrators use. However, they use them tactically. They use them isolated from one another. They don't use them collectively in, in any kind of a strategic approach. So what I'm going to talk to you this afternoon is about how to use some of those mechanisms, some of those tactical mechanisms in a strategic way. And I do that because, as I say, I believe that there are fundamental uh, limitations to our ability to patch and fix. Uh, first of all, patching and fixing as a security mechanism is ineffective. And if, if uh, I didn't already have numbers of them, certainly in the last three weeks you have seen that demonstrated fairly successfully, that we just don't get it done on a timely basis. It's inefficient. It takes too much time and too much energy. And in fact, uh, we, we, it's, it's not even clear that we've got enough resources in the whole wide world to be able to patch and fix anything if we wanted to. It tends to operate late. That is, our adversaries, the attackers, frequently have the intelligence before the community does. That's not to say that it's not already public and that everybody doesn't know about it. It's just that, that, that it only takes one attacker to use it. But if we're going to use that information defensively, it requires that we all know about it and we all act on it. It's destabilizing. If, in fact, I applied every single solitary patch as it came out the door, uh, I would find that very disruptive. Frequently, I would have applications that worked with the, with the uh, patch not in place that fail when I put the patch in place. 
one of the reasons that we tend to be behind is that enterprises will not simply take a patch because you say it's important and apply it to their systems. Because if they apply it over tens of thousands of systems and it turns out to be disruptive, then fixing that becomes the problem. So if the only strategy that we have for protecting ourselves against attacks is to patch and fix, the solution becomes the problem. Patching and fixing is simply disruptive and destabilizing. In addition to that, we don't always have sufficient trust in the source of the patch and fix in order to be willing to apply it. It is very clear that there are a lot of people who are resistant to simply taking a patch and applying it simply because Microsoft says do so. I mean, if Microsoft was all that good at shipping high quality code that was guaranteed not to be disruptive, we wouldn't have had the hole in the first place, would we? Experience tells us that we've got about a 50-50 chance of introducing a new problem when we introduce a patch or a fix to an old problem. Microsoft simply cannot regression test those patches and fixes even against their own suite, against their own test suite and do that on a very timely basis. What that means is that if they are going to ship something in time for it to do you any good to resist a, an attack like the code red worm coming down the pike, they're going to have to skip part of the tests that they would normally do. And you will not have time to do your regression testing and still be able to deploy the fix on a timely basis. Now that said, we have a system in place that just disproves everything I've already said. How would you like to live in a world in which all of the people who are attached to the internet via AOL were peer connected to the internet? AOL protects all of us from a great deal of potential mischief. It will not, for example, allow a user behind the AOL firewall to attack the internet. They just prohibit it. You are not peer connected to the internet. You are connected behind the AOL firewall. And the AOL firewall is in place as much to protect the internet from AOL users as to protect AOL users from the internet. And they do a very good job of it. Now, AOL reserves to itself the right to arbitrarily update its client across its network anytime it sees fit. If it is a particularly large fix, they may give you the option to defer it to a different time. That's particularly tr important if you are not persistently connected to the internet. But for the most part today, when you tell AOL, I'm through and you log off, if it's got pending fixes and patches, it just applies them. And apparently, it's doing a very good job. We are not hearing AOL users complaining about the fact that patches and fixes destabilize their system. So I can visualize a, wor a world in which vendors arbitrarily fix their code across the internet, across a wide population of systems. But now notice, those AOL systems are not enterprise systems. They're private systems, a distinction which we have not always made in the past, but which we need to start to make. So I can visualize a world in which all those private systems out there, Microsoft would just arbitrarily make change anytime it wants to. And I can tell you that they would like to do that because they understand that what they're doing right now is not working very well. So patching and fixing is limited. It's particularly limited when we put it into the context. And the first context I want to put it in is that every system connected to a network ought to be able to protect itself from any traffic that it is likely to see on that network. And if it can't do that, not only is it at risk, but it puts all of its neighbors at risk. That's what we're seeing in the distributed denial of service attacks that are being triggered by Code Red. Now notice. 
when people talk about the defense for code red what they say is what you ought to be doing to protect yourself and to protect your neighbors is to apply patches and fixes I'm going to demonstrate to you that there is one other extraordinarily important thing which you ought to be doing, but which nobody is doing, and which doesn't even seem to be on the list. Proposition number two says that general purpose operating systems, the two popular general purpose operating systems, that is Windows and Unix, cannot protect themselves from their traffic. They have not been successful in protecting themselves from their traffic. You can't expect to see them protect themselves from their traffic, and therefore, nice people do not connect them to the public network. And when they do connect them to the public network, the things that you have seen over the past three weeks, the disruption that you've seen over the past three weeks, is the consequences. General purpose operating systems simply have too much function in them in order for us to ever be able to say anything about their security. They are too flexible. There are too many switches that have to be set. My puppies tell me that in order to configure NT securely, you may have to perform as many as 300 different operations in order to configure it. It doesn't come to you safe out of the box. They go on to tell me that many of the settings aren't sticky. And therefore, the order in which you make them becomes important. You may set something, turn something off, believe that you are therefore safe from anybody abusing it, only to find that as you go through other operations, something else turns it back on again because it needs that function temporarily. It turns it back on, but it doesn't bother then to turn it off. General purpose operating systems are too loosely bound. This goes back to the earliest single debate that we have had in the, in the computing community. It goes all the way back to Howard Aiken, who did the Harvard Mark I, and John von Neumann, for whom the von Neumann architecture is named. Aiken said it abuses God's plan to put procedure and data in the same storage. God never intended for things to be that way. She didn't. And she has been punishing us ever since for the decision. Von Neumann, on the other hand, said, storage is too dear. It is too expensive to pre-allocate it, to decide in advance how it's going to be used. Besides that, if we, if we put procedure and data in the same storage, then we can do arithmetic on procedure. We can change it on the fly. Early computers, where storage was peculiarly dear, were specifically designed to take advantage of that. One of the early co popular computers was the IBM 1401. It was a card-oriented machine. It was going to read most of its data from punched paper. Therefore, every program could be expected to have a read-a-card instruction in it. The read-a-card instruction was a one specifically chosen so that there would always be a constant one in storage in case you needed it. The instructions for no-op and branch unconditional were deliberately chosen so that by adding the same constant value to one, you would produce the other. And that was how you did flip-flops. That's how you built switches. And therefore, switches were always in line. They were always in the code. They were never in a register. They were never in storage. They were never in a variable. They were always in the code itself. Created all kinds of complexity. But storage was very dear in the 1401. If I ask a group of my peers and contemporaries what the two storage options were, that is the two different sizes of storage that you could order on the IBM 1401 on day of announcement, nobody gets it right. 
everybody will say 4K was one of the options. It wasn't. The options were 2K and 1.4K from which the machine took its name. Von Neumann says storage is too dear. And I tell you that in a world in which I can go out and buy 128K for 100 bucks, storage is no longer dear. In von Neumann's time, it was, von Neumann got really upset. <clears throat> he discovered that the programmers were building a compiler to help them produce programs. And he went into a rage. He said, a precious scientific instrument should not be used to do clerical work. All of von Neumann's programmers were graduate students, and he thought programmers were cheap, but computers were dear. And of course, now, less than 50 years later, okay, we, we throw away computers. Computers are consumables. We simply use them up. Most of us have a basement full of them that we no longer use. Too loosely bound. That is, we reserve to the very last moment the option to change a program. Therefore, anybody can change it. Now, we can lock systems down. We can configure them so that it's much more resistant to late change, but we don't do it. They're too extensible, deliberately. Most of us wouldn't buy a computer if we thought all the functionality that we were ever going to get in it was locked down. Well, that's not quite true. Most of you have a computer with you right now whose function was completely and totally locked before it was shipped to you. You wear it on your wrist. When you want new functionality in this kind of computer, you wait till the battery, the most expensive component, runs down, and then you buy a new one. You get the hardware in the, in the uh, you get the, the function in the hardware. Our present collection of systems is simply too vulnerable to virus and other Trojan horse attacks. Four things necessary for a successful virus spread. One of them is that there's a large population of similar systems. That's one of the reasons why viruses spread extraordinarily well in Wintel machines, but they don't spread nearly so well in Unix machines. Population of Unix machines is simply smaller. Uh, second thing is those machines have to share. We have to be moving information and data back and forth between those machines. If we are not doing that, they are not vulnerable to, to uh, viruses and Trojan horses. Second, third is the program has to have a way for, to get itself executed. Viruses and Trojan horses love Windows machines because Windows machines have so many arbitrary ways in order for a program to get itself executed. We have Mr. Ganinsky out on the internet who doesn't do anything all day long except study Windows in order to find new arbitrary ways to get a program executed. And every time he thinks one up and publishes it, it creates all kinds of havoc for the rest of us. They're unsafe out of the box. Linux may be an exception, but most general purpose operating systems are configured out of the box to be easy to install, not safe to use and operate. The vendors want to be really certain that the machine doesn't lock up sometime during installation. So it is loosely configured as it out of the, out of the box. They're simply too difficult to configure and manage. There are simply too many different ways, too many different switches. And the, con and, and the consequence is we now have operating systems that ship, ship on two CDs. I understand that Windows XP will come on six. Six. My, my current, mach this machine has six gigabytes of storage. When I got it, I thought that was an awful lot. The one that replaces it will have seven times that much storage. And it'll cost exactly the same thing as this one cost. 
but the first six gigabytes of it is going to be consumed by Windows. They're not reliable. And we trust them for all sorts of inappropriate purposes. We've got all kinds of highly sensitive applications for which we use these general purpose operating systems, which simply aren't up to the task of running those sensitive applications. Therefore, we should not be connecting general purpose operating systems to the public network. Nice people simply don't do that. Except, of course, we do, don't we? Most everything that's connected to the internet is based upon one of those two systems. And yet, if you started from scratch to build it, you would never ever do it that way. So there are a bunch of tactics that are available to us. The, the first one I call structuring the network. And it says, let's build the network in layers. That is, let us do defense in depth. And this was very much the subject of my last talk here. And it fundamentally says, we've got to structure the network so that we have at least four layers. The first layer is that layer which we think of as the internet and the public dial switched network. Now notice, today the wires that we use for those two networks are exactly the same. The switches that we use for those two networks are exactly the same. The only real difference between those two networks today is the address space. In the public dial switched voice analog network, addresses are represented by telephone numbers. In the internet, they are represented by IP addresses. But other than that, there is not much to distinguish those two networks. And there are so many gateways that tie the two together that for all intents and purposes today, there is the public network. You can divide it into two if you like, but that's it. There is the enterprise network, okay? This is the network on which we do everything else. And we have a very thin barrier between the two networks. But I'm going to suggest that the enterprise network really should have three layers at least. The user to application layer, that is the layer where users connect to applications, the layer on which they log on. Then there should be the system to system network. This is the virtual mainframe network. If I put 100 applications in a, in a mainframe, those applications can recognize and trust one another. The reason that they can is because the mainframe operating system and the mainframe hardware protect them from any outside interference or contamination. It not only does that, it, protects, it does process to process isolation so that they cannot interfere with one another. And they generally have a very high level of trust. Well, in the modern network, we tend to run an application on its own hardware. We don't put it in the same box with everything else. We run it as a server or a service. So I may have a user application running here supported by a user authentication and naming service and a directory service, both of those supported by a database management server, and both of those supported by a file system. I do not want those processes to have to dynamically authenticate one another every time they talk. So I give them their own trusted private network called the system to system network on which they can talk. I may build that system to system network either with dedicated hardware and dedicated network interface cards separate from the other networks or I may build it with secret codes. There's the control network. This is the network on which, you, which, on which operators talk to systems. This is a privileged network. Only privileged commands can appear on this network, and privileged commands can only appear on this network. Operating systems are connected to this network. Operators are connected to this network. Applications are not. And applications cannot talk to one another on this network. Now, I submit to you that it is time for us to begin to layer the public network.
we have two silos, two different address spaces. But we need to begin to layer that network so that the broadband backbone network is protected by the edge networks. Networks like AOL, networks like the school, networks like the universities. All of those networks which support individuals rather than systems should have to vouch for those individuals. Just like AOL does, right? AOL says, we vouch for every one of our users. We take responsibility and accountability for their behavior. Tell us that they are abusing you and we will take steps to make them stop. Even if it means that we have to stop having them as a customer. So we need to start putting, we, we, we've gone through three phases in the internet so far. In the first phase, what we did was we made the internet look free to all the end users. You didn't have to, nobody paid for it. Everybody who used it saw it as a free resource. Institutions and governments supported it. But everybody used it, saw it as a free resource. And we achieved a great deal of growth that way. And that period of growth was very important. But at some point or another, we said, gee, we can't continue to fund the growth that way. We have to have some kind of revenue associated with it. So we began to offer metered services. The first metered service I used charged me for a mailbox and for messages. But it freed me from DocMaster and IBM, which were the only places where I could get network or could get mailboxes before that. Then we began to charge people for connect time. That was a very good way of metering. And it worked very well. It gave us enough revenue to produce capital so that we could build out the network. After we got it built out, what we saw was that the cost of delivering services dropped dramatically. And so we said, okay, what we'll do is we'll go to flat rate pricing. We will continue to charge people, but we won't charge them based upon what we do or how long they're connected or anything else. We'll just charge them a flat rate for the privilege of connecting to the edge of the network. Now, I'm going to suggest to you that, in the, that a lot of the problems that we have in the internet today are based upon that charging model. But it has, boy, has it resulted in growth. Whew! And now the growth the solution has become the problem. And so I argue that we ought to be going back to delivering metered services in the internet. Suppose that you had to pay for the delivery of every email message that you sent. Would there be spammers? What if the spammer had to bear the real cost of delivering all the messages that he sent? Now, I understand that what I'm suggesting to you is heresy. We all thought that the price of using the internet was going to continue to fall forever. And I'm not opposed to it continuing to fall forever. But whatever it costs us to operate it, if people do not have to pay the real cost of the way they use it, they will continue to use it in ways which the rest of us perceive as rude and disruptive. Sir. People send out junk mail to you in a post office box. They absorb the cost of any one of those items, but it had to stop junk mail from being sent out. As a matter of fact, as a matter of fact, they don't, do they? Junk mail in the post office is underwritten by, by first class mail, right? And is there anybody here who appreciates all the junk mail that he gets in the, in the postal service? Nobody? It is a ter I, when I'm on, I'm on the road all the time. When I go back, there are three or four piles of mail that have stacked up for me to sort through. My rules are, if it's not in a first class envelope, if it doesn't have a return address on it, if I don't recognize the return address, it gets chucked. I, there's not enough time in my life to go through all the stuff that appears in my mailbox. I argue that both systems would work better <laughs> if people bore the real cost of what they are doing. But the fact of the matter is that, that the allocation of postal rates in the U.S. Postal Service is political, it is not economic. 
It is that the, the mass marketers have so much political clout in Congress that those rates continue to be that way and that it creates behavior that the rest of us would just as soon avoid. Structured, yes, Cynthia. So you're suggesting that the people at the edge of the network um, enforce a policy that will protect the network? I am. So how are you going to make them do that? I hope I don't have to. I hope that everybody will eventually see the wisdom of doing it. Well, what if there's a bad guy? I can tolerate him. I can tolerate lots of bad guys. I will always be able to afford ISPs who are rude. Now, eventually my perception is we're going to ostracize a lot. We already did that in email, right? We've already told ISPs, if you are the source of lots of spam, the rest of us are going to ostracize you. And we have compelled them to stop doing it. Now, there's still a bunch of them out there that do it. UUNet does it as a matter of policy. They make a lot of money. All the spammers want to be attached to UUNet. They don't want to be attached to Earthlink or MindSpring or even the Naval Postgraduate School because we're not going to tolerate the rude behavior, sir. AOL has the, has the money that they can shut off somebody if they're doing malicious behavior. But most of your other ISPs, when you contact them, tell them that somebody's pinging me or port scanning me or whatever, they're not going to shut them off because they're making money off them. Well, let, let, me, let, let, me, let me give you an example. This morning I was talking to uh, the Chief Information Assurance Officer for the University of Southern California. He says, in order to be able to use my network, you have to agree to behave in an orderly manner. I said, well, is it working? He says, yeah. He says, we have very, very few, very little rude behavior. We have to take relatively little corrective action. We've got a lot of controls in place. We've got a lot of monitoring in place. We make it a big thing out of publishing our policy, but we attach 20,000 people to the internet and we require certain kinds of behavior of them. For example, they may not attach arbitrary devices to our network. If you want to attach a device to our network, a network interface card to our network, you have to have permission to do that. The permission can be granted to you by the head of your department, but you have to have it. You can't just arbitrarily come in and connect something to it. I went to George Mason, in fact, Cynthia and I were at the same meeting at George Mason University, big room, three or four times the size of this one, and there was a hole in the wall. So I took my wireless access point over and I plugged it in the hole in the wall. One of my colleagues says, that's rude, you really shouldn't do that. But he immediately took out his wireless card and began to use it. Two and a half days later, when I disconnected it, Eight heads around the room popped up and started looking around, trying to figure out whether anybody else was aware that the, net, that the internet had suddenly disappeared. So two weeks later, I go to USC. I'm going to teach a class, about this size room, about half this many people. It's going to be a week-long class. I take my access point over to the nearest hole in the wall, and I plug it in. All the lights turn green but it doesn't get an IP address. So I unplug it. I go over to a hole in the wall where there's already a machine plugged in. I unplug the machine and I plug my access point in there. All the lights turn green, no IP address. About this time, Stan Gatewood, the Chief Information Assurance Officer for the university, comes walking down the hall. I say, Stan, I'm trying to get an IP address and I can't get one. He says, that's because the MAC address of your access point is not registered. And therefore, the DHCP server won't give you an IP address. I said, Stan, don't you know that the requirement to pre-register devices is the reason that TCP IP won out over SNA SDLC? He said, what's SNA SDLC? So, we are moving back in the direction of putting structure and controls back into this network that we worked so hard to make absolutely flat because we find out that we can't live with an absolutely flat network. It's too disruptive. So on his network, if you want to send a packet into the internet, 
the gateway checks to ensure that the origin address is within the domain of the university. If it's not an IP address that is assigned to the university, you can't get it through the gateway. Now, suppose that an IIS server on his network gets contaminated with code red. It cannot spread itself beyond the university because the gateway won't let arbitrary packets go through. And that's the other thing that we ought to be doing in our networks and that nobody is talking about. They say, patch your systems. I say, right, and do egress filtering. Urgent. My system may fall over, but I don't allow it to do arbitrary things to the rest of the network. I patch and fix in order to protect myself. I do egress filtering to protect my neighbors. And incidentally, it turns out to protect myself because notice what happens. When my IIS system attacks your IIS system, the first thing your system does is attack me back again. <laughs> And so I'm going to put those patches, I'm going to put that egress filtering in there in order to protect my neighbors. Now this is an illustration of the network, public, private, trusted network, and operator, okay? Localize, the in, 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 order, in addition to the layers, localize. Put in silos and towers. I had one client said, we want you to build a perimeter around our network because their network was peer connected to the internet. You could not tell, tell where the internet ended and their network began. So we built them a perimeter. And then we noticed that there was no layering inside, so we built the layering inside. And then we noticed that there was affinity among the users. Customer support people hardly ever talked to developers or even backroom operations people. So we put routers in between those populations of people, their localized lands, and we put in rules. And we said, if you want to talk to somebody on the other side of that router, please tell your manager. and your manager will arrange for you to be able to do it. Incidentally, the other person on the other side, their manager has to agree. And then we will permit traffic to flow across there. So we can do it by function, we can do it by geography, we can do it by topology, or we can do it by user affinity, but we must do it. And we must begin to add structure into our internal network. I have a client got 600,000 users on their internal network. I remember when the whole internet wasn't 600,000 users. And that's how many users they have just on their internal network. And about 100,000 of those are contractors and consultants and, uh, and, and uh, all kinds of trading partners. But they're not employees. So they erect a firewall in front of every single solitary sensitive application in the whole business. <laughs> in order to get through that firewall, you have to authenticate yourself to that firewall. And if you can't do that, you can't use the application that is behind it. And when you, when you log on successfully to the firewall, you still don't see the whole application. Part of it remains hidden behind, that, behind those firewalls. and use egress filtering. Prefer composed application-aware firewalls, but not every time. I have this wonderful computer at home. It is more powerful by far than the first PC I ever had. It's only about this big. It's got in it, uh, oh, it does network address translation. It has a DHCP client in it. 
It has a DHCP server in it. It has a web server in it. It's got firewall functionality in it. It's got a switch in it. I can connect up to four wires to it and it'll switch traffic between those four wires. You can now buy the equivalent of this machine for 80 bucks. It has one other wonderful property. That is, you can't change any of the programs in it. They are reliable, they are orderly, they are well-behaved, and they were bound in the factory. Now, to me, that's a feature. But as soon as I tell somebody that, they say, what happens when the manufacturer upgrades the software? I say, I throw the box away and I buy a new one. For 80 bucks, I cannot afford to do otherwise. Some of you go out to, the, to uh, look at, at the University of uh, Massachusetts at Amherst and look for IPIC, I-P-I-C. IPIC is a little piece of hardware about that big. The hardware costs 75 cents. The software costs a few hundred thousand dollars, but don't worry about it, because for 75 cents I can replicate it one more time. It has IP in it. It has slip in it. It has HTTP in it. It has, an, uh, it has an HTML server in it. It's a wonderful little device. It's only about that big. Now, if I replicate that device enough times, I can have web servers that sell for a dollar. And I submit to you that if I have a web server that sells for a dollar, I cannot afford to change a page in it much less can I afford to change software in it. If I want a new page or I want new software, I will throw it away and I will get a new one. Cheap hardware solves all kinds of problems. It specifically solves the problems that von Neumann created when he said we are going to put storage and program or data and programs in the same storage. Now, I argue that, oh, uh, I saw another one. This one only had three ports on the inside. It had two ports on the outside. One of them was an Ethernet port designed to be connected to a cable modem or a DSL modem. The other one was a serial port designed to be connected to a modem. It gave you dial backup. After the rebate, it cost $55. You buy a computer far more powerful than the first PC I ever had with all this wonderful software in it for $55. You can't buy a software firewall for $55. And I can buy a hardware firewall for, one, for $55. Now, I'm going to go up and talk to the, to the uh, US Military Academy at West Point in the spring. They're going to have a big exercise, right? They're going to have a red team and a black team. And it's going to be the job of the black team to try and lock the network down so that the red team can't increase its privileges. And I say, and right after you do that, I'm going to tell you about these $55 boxes. Now, the black team's not going to have access <laughs> to those $55 boxes. And if you told them that they, that, they, that, that they could have access to them, they would still think $55 was very expensive. But I absolutely guarantee you, you cannot lock down a Wintel or a Linux box for $55. You can't do it. The reason I bought that router in the first place was I couldn't configure the Microsoft uh, Internet services for $55. In fact, the one I paid, I paid 180 for mine. The new one was 120, and the current market price is 55. And I guarantee you, you can't say grace over that machine for $55. And it completely hides it from the network. 
Oh, if you manage to get a program on my side and run it, it might be able to start something outbound, but it can't start stuff inbound, and it won't accept anything inbound. And if you probe my address, my IP address, nothing will respond. It's as though there is nothing at that address. Use value-added networks and VPNs between sites. Okay? Structure the hide operating systems. Do not connect operating system controls to the same network as the application. Nice people don't do that. You control operating systems out of band. We've known about out of band management for 30 years. And the only people who do in band management are IT folks. Nobody else does it. We don't do it in any other technology that we use. In no other technology do we put those controls intended to be reserved to management right next to the controls intended to be used by the users. Nobody else does that. It's the moral equivalent of taking the little knob on top of the autopilot on the 747 and putting a replica of it on, the, on every entertainment console in the passenger cabin and then putting a little red placard on it that says, please don't touch. Nice people don't do that. Only in IT do we do that. Hide the operating system under the application. When hardware was expensive, we believed that people should log on to the operating system, never to the application. We were wrong. Hardware is cheap, people are expensive, and therefore only operators should be able to log on to the operating system. That's why it's called the operating system. Put it on separate media. And that, of course, implies that it's got to be on separate network interface cards. And the network managers will tell me, Murray, you're insane. You're suggesting I have to have an extra network interface card in every one of my machines just to be used by the operator in the operating system. I say, right. Anybody know the street price for an Ethernet card for a Wintel machine these days? 18 bucks. Nine. Don't tell me that. <laughs> Cheap hardware solves lots of problems, guys. Presents us with all kinds of opportunities that we didn't have before. Now he says, oh, but Murray, you don't understand, I'm operating an HP 9000, the cards cost $400. I said, that's roughly what you pay an operator for a day. Hardware is cheap. We ought to be taking advantage of that in order to make our systems safer. Hide the operating system behind strong authentication. Nobody ought to be able to log on to an operating system with nothing but a password. Nice people don't do that. Hide it behind crypto. The operator's client should always talk to the server operating system using SSH. That's what it was designed and intended for. The operating system shouldn't respond to anybody who is not talking in SSH. And if I hide a lot of that stuff, oh, and then we've got to simplify the operating system. Remove, hide all the functions not required by the application. What does that include? Well, for one thing, it includes editors. It includes compilers. It includes command interpreters. If you've got a web server connected to the public network, it should not have a command interpreter on it. Much less should the application fail to that interpreter. Nice people don't do that. Why? Because it makes your application a target. There are people who will go out there and crash your application for no other reason than to get access to the command line, which pops up as soon as it causes the application to fail. Nice people don't do that. Services. We should not have all of these services configured on our system. Why? They are gratuitous. 
IIS didn't buy us anything. <laughs> it just made us vulnerable. Scripts. This morning there was another article in the, in, on the internet about cold fusion. Cold Fusion is a web server intended to implement e-commerce and it ships with all kinds of example scripts enabled. All you have to know is the application is running Cold Fusion and then you ask, you put up a URL that references one of these scripts and you get all kinds of lovely function. A couple of years ago, I called up one of my friends to ask him to come, who's, he's a, an MVS integrity expert. I asked him to compare the integrity of MVS with what I remember it being. He says, oh, it's still as good as it ever was. He says, but of course, IBM now ships all kinds of other wonderful things in the box with it. They ship this thing called, uh, what is it? Open MVS. Get concerned when I just hear the name. OpenMVS is a POSIX compliant process that runs on top of MVS just like TSO does. And you can take any POSIX compliant application written to run on Unix and it will run on OpenMVS, including the IBM branded version of Apache, the web server. And what ships with Apache? This wonderful script called GetMVS. All you have to know is enough about this script to call it. And it will allow you to do arbitrary moves, copies, and edits to any MVS data set. Anyone. At least anyone that the Apache can see. And Apache can see everything because out of the box it is configured to run privileged, bypasses the, the, the access controls. These things are getting us into all kinds of problems. Other programs, for example, set UID pro programs should not be in the command processors. Take them all out. Notice the previous slide presumes Unix or other systems where functions map to programs. In Windows, functions don't map to programs. I can't simply take out a DLL because it is associated with a function that I don't want to be in there because I don't know what is in it. <laughs> and if I try to take one out, I am likely to break all kinds of other things. But in Unix, if I don't want a command processor in the machine, I just take it out. And it's gone. And it will not magically reappear. I've got to come back with, with, with operator privileges and either get it off of a diskette or get it off of a server. But if the application dies, nobody is going to find it. Operating systems where one can non-disruptively remove function and know for sure that it is gone. NT can't do that. The AS400 can. Configure production systems for safety. Hide the root directory. We ought to be doing this on every system. We ought to be hiding operator privileges. We ought to be setting UID to narrow privileges, never ever to root. Nice people never set UID to root. And you say, oh, but I have to because this application won't run if I don't do that. And I say, then don't run that application. It is not orderly, it is not well behaved. Configure applications to fail to a halt, not to the operating system. Restrict all right access to programs. There should be no arbitrary right access to programs. And do not replicate controls. Prefer strong and diverse materials. Part of the vulnerability that we now have in the internet is that we rely almost exclusively on two operating systems. And most of the time, or at least some of the time, that operating system is not appropriate to the intended application. We should be using our materials only with respect for their limitations. I can build a bridge across a river with toothpicks. It isn't easy. It would certainly be easier with steel. But I can do it. Our problem is 
I, but to do it, I've got to compensate for the, for the strength of materials of toothpicks, right? I've got to do all kinds of lamination. I've got to put them on end and on top of one another. I've got to weave them in and out. In the process, do not bend them to fit the intended application, because if you do, you will break them. Configure personal systems for safety. Use personal firewalls like we've talked about. Virus scanners on all of them. Hide the file system or the command processor on personal systems. We should be operating our systems today in one of two modes. I can have a multi-user single application system or I can have a single user multi-application system. Nice people do not run multi-user multi-application systems, at least not attached to the internet. Even on personal systems, there are some gratuitous services which I have to, 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 to deactivate. Restrict write access to programs. Do not load or execute from writable libraries. That's how viruses spread, right? Large population of similar systems, communication between the systems, way for the program to get itself executed, and storage to which it can write. So if an arbitrary program can write to that storage, I don't want to execute programs out of it and recognize the limitations of thin clients. Automate, instrument, and monitor. Minimize operator intervention. Initialize systems from trusted sources. When I talked to Mr. Gatewood at USC this morning, he says, I initialize my systems every day. All the kiosk systems sitting out there on the campus, Every day, they are initialized from scratch because during the course of the day, they may have become contaminated. Because my machines reinitialize every day, my network is self-healing. Yes, sir? What did you say about thin clients on the previous? Recognize the limitations that are associated with thin clients. Thin clients can't tell with the servers that they are dealing with. And, 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 the, and the examples, of course, are Hotmail, WebTax, all of these kinds of applications where the thin client interprets what should be text, but which is, in fact, HTML. Dedicated. High integrity logs in journals that is written to write once, read many drives, or with digital signatures and digital timestamps. Digital signatures and digital timestamps give us the ability to make computer audit trails dramatically stronger than the audit trails that we ever had in paper, instead of dramatically less as they have been for 50 years, and take the system offline to maintain it. Vendors can help. They can ship stuff that's safe out of the box. They can include personal firewalls, but I still prefer a hardware firewall to a software firewall shipped to me by Microsoft. Because anything that is in software can be contaminated or interfered with. We can structure the roles, roles-based access control, and we're seeing more of that, and secure sandboxes in which I can execute things knowing that they cannot interfere with or contaminate. Like the Netscape browser, right? Or the Java virtual machine. It's got a security model that comes with it. Prefer early binding of function. I like this card. I like all these cards. I like smart cards. I like computers where there is no software that you can manage from the outside. Prefer hardware and more hardware and even more hardware. Dedicated servers. Single application systems single user systems. Hide all those multi-user, multi-application systems and consider alternative operating systems so that we d reduce the uniformity of the network, introduce diversity and thereby make it less. Use trusted systems. I have one customer who says, what do you mean I should use separate hardware in order to get trust? He says, I trust my MVS system. I said, you trust MVS? He says, you didn't hear me. What I told you was I trust my MVS system. I have had that MVS system for 20 years. I have been tweaking it and tuning it and locking it down. I have lots and lots of experience with it, and I trust it. I don't trust MVS out of the box. 
I trust what I have done with that MVS system over the years. We have done a pretty good job of securing the links in the network. We know how to do that. We will ultimately solve the problem of the servers. When we get all the servers locked down and we get all the links locked down, it is the client systems that are managed by individuals that will become the targets of the hackers. Now, I know that some of what I've told you is going to be hard to do, but it is right. And if the internet is important, and I think it is, then it's time to start doing it right. Let me tell you one more, oh, I, I took this story out. It's hidden. Uh, my brother's new yacht just took 10 hours off the 20-year-old, 20 25-year-old record of boats sailing from Pensacola to the Isla Mujeres. 10 hours. And he placed second to Larry Ellison on the Chicago to Mackinac race. Now, when we first started to buy boats together, what we said was we are buying boats in order to teach seamanship learned at our daddy's knee to the next generation. My daddy said, son, when you go to sea, make sure your boat is well found. He says, take on spares of everything that you can think of that might break. Batteries, flashlights. When you've taken on all the spares you can think of, take on some duct tape, some bailing wire, and some inner tubes. It is amazing the emergency repairs that can be made at sea with inner tubes. And he says, and when all else fails, you can get out and ride on them. He says, son, Never, ever buy a boat from a shipwright who builds in those materials. If the internet is important, it is time for us to change our behavior. Patching and fixing is not going to cut it. Now, I realize that I have run five minutes over my time. I didn't really. We used up five minutes of my time at the beginning. I still managed to finish in one hour. Uh, I will be happy to stay around here and answer any questions that you have, but I understand that your schedule says you may have to be someplace else. Thank you very much. Before we get up and leave, I would like to ask one question, and that's about .NET. <laughs> so this, that flies in the face of everything that you just said. Yes, it does. A uh, couple, of, couple of observations. Uh, when I first, .NET is going to ride on XML. XML is metadata. It is data about the data. It makes the intent, the use, and the encoding, and all kinds of other things about the data obvious and transparent. And it is going to give us a big, huge increase in interoperability. It has the potential even to help us increase security, but it also has the intent, the, the ability to hide and obscure and obfuscate, to confuse and to dupe. So like everything else, we're going to have to use it very, very carefully. But part of the strategy of .NET says we are going to go to network-based services even while clients are getting cheaper and smarter and faster by the minute in part because our children do not want to be bothered with having to know about or to install software. So we are going to be moving in the direction of thin clients and network-based services. And the potential, I mean, after all, the implication of that is code is no longer reliable, right? We can no longer rely upon the content of our own systems. We probably can't rely upon them to protect us from things which are in the internet. And that means we're going to have to put a much, much higher requirement on the people that we do business with over the internet. The implication is that lots and lots of vendors are going to be maintaining a little tiny bit of client code where they're going to be installing that client code on the fly only when needed. That's why we have to have the trusted sandboxes in which those things operate. 
so that you can't escape from the browser and contaminate the underlying system. And you're going to have to trust all the people that you do business with. Now, we do that, right? For the most part, we all trust Microsoft. Not because we want to, but because we don't have any choice. We let them, we let them ship us that, the six diskettes or six CDs, and we install them. And we run everything they tell us to run. Even if they confuse us and scare us and hide things from us, and even if the quality of the code doesn't warrant doing that. Why? Because we love all of the new toys that come with that new operating system. And we love all the new hardware that that operating system will support, which the old one won't support. So, uh, going to require lots of trusted relationships in the future in order to be able to live with .NET. But XML has also got a lot of security suites that come with it. Can be used to solve a lot of problems. It's important to understand what those security suites are and how they interoperate. Uh, if any of you would like it, I will send you my paper on uh, on XML. Uh, it's a wonderful paper, and it's a wonderful language. It's really got on. It's 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 the ultim, the open the most open language we've ever had, the most extensible language that we will have ever had, and it not only tells us what to do, but it tells us what we're doing it to. Uh, Larry Ellison said at a conference in Paris, nice people do not write programs in proprietary languages or store data in proprietary formats. Nice people do not store data separate from its metadata. And XML is the ultimate metadata. It's like being able to take all of the metadata that's in the database with the data and move it wherever the data goes. That's a wonderful property. And it was the absence of metadata that gave us the, the, the Y2K problem. Not only did we have data encoded the wrong way, but we didn't know where it was. When I first started, we wrote the metadata on the outside of the punched paper if we were lucky, but it was not machine readable. Most of the time, it was written on a, on a, on a card layout stored in a three-ring binder up on a shelf. <clears throat> a gigabyte in punched paper would fill this room. And with the card readers of the day, it would take a year and a half to read it. <laughs> Just one gigabyte of punch paper filled this room. So cheap hardware can solve a lot of our problems. It can solve a lot of the problems that are, that are associated with things like .NET, because the hardware can't be interfered with or contaminated. Thank you. Yeah. Come on down. As Ferris Bueller says, it's over. Go home.